I'm Mark Edwards. Welcome to Travelog and welcome to Tongren in northeastern Guizhou. We're here for their famed annual Dragon Boat Festival and we're hopefully going to discover what this mysterious province has to offer. Here we are at the launch event of the annual International Dragon Boat Festival and 30,000 people have packed into this arena to watch live music and performances highlighting Tongren's many ethnic minorities. Tongren lies on the northeastern border of Guizhou, one of China's less developed provinces. In recent years, monumental efforts have been made through blockbuster developments to turn it into a transport hub in China's southwest, complete with new expressways and airports. This makes sense when you take in the fact that the province is bordered by Chongqing municipality to the north and Hunan province to the east. Tongren itself is a vital nexus between central China and the southwest frontier and accordingly is known as the gateway to Guizhou. The many performances today have given us an insight into Noor culture, highlighted in the slightly more daring pieces. Noor is a time-honoured cultural phenomenon of rituals practised to expel evil spirits and disease. The name is derived from one such ritual, where people shouted Noor, Noor, to drive away the devil. It's a complex mix of anthropology, ethnicity, folk customs, religious ceremonies and drama. Of particular interest is the fact that historically some Noor devotees were known to be adept at, amongst other things, acrobatics and the rather more unusual skills of swallowing glass, eating porcelain, swimming in boiling water and walking on blades. These days the performances are simply for show, but they highlight the importance that Noor culture still enjoys today in these parts of China. Having become well and truly intrigued by Noor culture, I've made some inquiries and found that I can find out more if I head up to Dongshan Mountain. Lying on the east side of the old part of Tongren, Dongshan used to lie within the old city walls. Since the Zhou dynasty around a thousand years BC, most towns of a significant size in China possessed a city wall. Like various other innovations in Chinese history, the invention of the city wall is attributed to a semi-mythological sage, in this case a Xia dynasty leader called Gun. It is said that Gun built an inner wall to defend the king and an outer wall within which the people could settle. It was a principle in building cities that they should be sited so that they were not constrained by geography. Feng Shui masters would be called in to make sure that the walled city itself as well as its gates and towers were in just the right place. Here in Tongren, dozens of temples dating back to the Ming and Qing dynasties, some of them 600 years old, stand on Dongshan Mountain.
So I've uh, hiked up to the top of Dong Shan, which is the East Mountain, and there's a temple up here which moonlights as a museum. One of the only museums in China to be dedicated to the worship of the Nuo culture, which is a form of animism or the worship of spirits. Now, as you can see, it's raining pretty heavily, so it looks like for the next hour or so, I'm going to have a few scary masks and some spirits for company. In many ways, the rain pounding outside simply serves to reinforce the atmosphere on the inside. Much of Noor culture is dedicated to drama, and the masks are supposed to make the performances more powerful. Noor opera, or Noor drama as it's alternatively known, is called the living fossil of opera. It's one of the most popular forms of folk opera in southwestern China. It has a long history with roots that can be traced back all the way to 1600 BC. Apart from the ferocious masks, it has a number of other special features, such as the unique dresses and adornments, the strange language used in performances, and the mysterious scenes. The opera integrates religious and dramatic culture. Essentially, the purpose of Noor opera is to drive away devils, disease and evil influences and petition the gods for blessings. I think that's probably enough scary masks for one day. But if you have any interest in the etymology of Chinese characters, you might want to linger in the Noor Museum for a little bit longer. On the pillars, you will see inscribed certain characters. They're in fact written, or created might be a more appropriate word, by the ancient Noor ancestors. The twist is that in fact, even a Chinese person will not recognize the majority of them. And don't bother turning to your Chinese dictionary, as that will prove to be a waste of time as well. Only dedicated scholars of Noor culture will be able to enlighten you as to the meaning. Don't let the weather get you down. You don't want to miss the only remaining active temple on Dongshan Mountain. Run by a faithful group of Buddhist devotees and scholars, who live here permanently. The temple is primarily dedicated to Guan Yin, the goddess of mercy and compassion. She is immensely popular among Chinese Buddhists, who see her as a source of unconditional love. The temple was built in the Tang Dynasty over a thousand years ago, but has been destroyed and rebuilt many, many times over the years, with its most recent renovation in 2002. The bricks and mortar might not be the same, but the culture has survived the test of time. In an age of unrelenting advances in technology, it's a breath of fresh air to make it to the summit of the Dongshan Mountain and witness these people going quietly about their daily lives, devoting themselves to prayer and quiet introspection. Having torn ourselves away from the cute puppies, we head back down the mountain. We spare a moment on the way out to take in the old city and its Catholic church. This part of town, known as Zhongnanmen, literally meaning middle south gate of the old city, used to be the commercial, economic and cultural centre of Tongren. The weather might have taken a bit of the shine off, but you can still appreciate the impressive architecture, which has been around here for hundreds of years. Considering the frequency of the short, sharp downpours in Tongren, it can be raining cats and dogs for half an hour 
before the sun comes crashing through for the same amount of time, and then the process is repeated. It's a good thing that there's a very good irrigation system in place here. So you won't necessarily need to be wearing your wellies for your whole stay. With a relatively small population of around 100,000 people in the city itself, and just over 300,000 people in Tongren County, it is nevertheless the largest population centre in Guizhou's northeast. Right, it's time to get out of the city and onto one of the top tourist spots in the whole of Tongren. So we're heading up towards the Nine Dragon Caves, so called because there were six yellow dragons. Chinese legend says they invited another three black dragons onto this hill and they all decided to meet in a cave and loved it so much that they decided to live there. Hence its name, Nine Dragon Cave. This is the mode of transport to get up there, so I'm going to get on the horse. Three. <sighs> So as you can see, the Nine Dragon Cave, or Zhou Lundong, as it's known in Chinese, is slightly, or well, totally off the beaten track. However, in many ways, this simply adds to the charm of the place and the sense of achievement when you finally make it up there. You'll first need to take a bus, and you should go roughly 15 kilometers east and get off a couple of kilometers past the town of Mayan. From there, you can cross the Jin River by ferry and hop on a horse for a couple of kilometers till you get to the top. To keep you company on the way, there are verdant forests, upright hills and crystal clear creeks. So, from the light outside to the darkness inside, I'm heading into the heart of the Nine Dragons Cave. It's slightly chillier already and I'm feeling a little cold. Once inside, you'll be able to appreciate the theme park nature of the cave. There are lifelike animals and wonderful structures formed by the stalactites and stalagmites. The cave has three renowned halls, the first being a somewhat flat roof place with appealing scenery, including a waterfall, a dragon with a ball in its mouth, and a white elephant. Whether you're a cynic or not, try joining in and guessing what the rocks look like. So I've made a friend whilst I've been walking around the Nine Dragon Cave and he's been very kind enough to explain some of the wildlife that's on display here, the stone wildlife on display. And he's also told me he's got a special talent, but he's feeling a little shy. So uh, let's, get him, uh, let's get him going. Come on, show, show us what this special talent is. The second cave is also flat roof with exquisite stone curtain designs. And the third hall is the real gem of the Nine Dragon Cave. Its roof is round and in it stand six huge pillars, each about 30 meters in height. Don't miss out on the large jellyfish which rises up for nine meters. We only caught a glimpse before the power cut out on us. So uh, this is uh, completely unplanned. Um, the electricity unfortunately has cut out in, uh, in the nine dragon cave. We were right at the far end when it did. Luckily a few people have brought uh, torches. I've got this little pen torch which isn't going to be too helpful but we're going to try and find our way back it's quite exciting and a bit a bit of suspense in the air come with me come with me even if the lights do cut out it shouldn't detract from the fact that venturing deep into the belly of the nine dragons cave is a fantastic experience and then, uh, 
uh, now it's like torrential rain with thunder and lightning. And we had to, we were two and a half kilometres up a mountain, so we had to ride our horses back down. It's uh, very good fun. Yes, my heart. So Tomrin is situated in a very small bowl. Well, you say small, it's surrounded by a load of mountains and it has a subtropical climate, which means during the summer months, like we are now, it gets pretty humid and pretty hot. So that's where all the sweating comes from. Don't forget to bring a tiny bit of deodorant. But, like everything, there's a silver lining. And for us, it's the lush foliage that you can find everywhere here. During the annual International Dragon Boat Festival, you'll get the vibe that the whole of Tongren is geared up solely for this one event. Whether it be supporting the local team, performing in the many shows, making pieces that will feature in the show, or even participating down on the river. We've done the Dragon Caves today, and we're waiting for the dragon boat competition to kick off. But there's an old Chinese myth that states that the dragons are in fact the ones who control the water. So let's hope they're feeling generous today. So there's a rather large disparity between the eastern and western views on the dragon. In the west, it is feared, and it's certainly not the animal of choice that you would bring to a dinner party. However, it's a completely different story in the east, and in China in particular, where it is revered and seen as a symbol of power, strength, and an ability to protect, which is why many emperors throughout the ages would use the dragon as their very own symbol to show them as a higher power. Now, many Chinese also believe that their spirits are descended from the dragon. That's to do with the makeup, where it's made up of lots of different animals. We've got eagle claws, we've got fish scales, snake-shaped bodies, amongst other things. Now, it's not a surprise that here in Tongren, we're celebrating the dragon during the Dragon Bay Festival in such a way. It should be said that not even a torrential downpour in the morning deterred the crowds from coming in their thousands. Hanging on to every patch of ground along the river, they were rewarded for their determination with a five-hour boating and visual spectacular. This event is as much about everything that goes on around it than it is about the actual racing itself. There were a whole host of dress rehearsals and intricate choreography that went into planning this to make this the event of the year for Tongren people. The history of the dragon boats can be traced all the way back to 287 BC when the old state of Chu, which covered modern day northern Hunan, was under siege. The invaders were the Qin armies that would later bring the whole of China under their rule. At the time, an exiled poet and politician of Chu, named Xu Yuan, heard of his fellow people's plight. 
A victim of court intrigue, he nonetheless remained a great patriot. And rather than see the state he loved conquered, he picked up a heavy stone and threw himself into the Mi Luov River. Distraught, the local people rushed to save him in their boats, but were too late. They returned later to scatter zongzi, which were packets of meat and sticky rice wrapped in reeds and lotus leaves. They beat drums and splashed the water with their paddles in order to keep the fish and evil spirits away from his body. The legend has it that the scattering of the zongzi was to prevent him from going hungry. Though another belief is that the people scattered rice to feed the fish in order to prevent them from devouring the the Dragon Boat Festival held here in Tongren and throughout China on the fifth day of the fifth lunar month, around June or July, commemorates the rowers' hopeless rescue bid. So the reason we've all come to Tongren for the international Dragon Boat Race. Yesterday was the festival, today's the competition. Over 2,000 years of history, and it's going to be a cracker. Have a look. These fierce competitions are held throughout China at this time between local and international dragon boat teams. They can be seen training in their narrow, powerful craft for months before the event, to the steady boom of a drum dictating the speed and tempo they should follow. The race themselves only last a few minutes, but there's a whole paraphernalia of rituals and activities that must be gone through in and around the boats, during and after the race. So don't worry, it's a real spectator sport. All in all, the real charm of Guizhou, and Tongren in particular, is the off the beaten track feel. For all you more intrepid travellers out there, I hope that this is a call to arms. Add in the fact that more often than not, you'll have the track to yourself, then you really get the sense of venturing into the unknown. And just in case that's not enough, then remember all the ethnic minorities living here. They bring a huge amount of colour to Guizhou and its social calendar. In fact, Guizhou celebrates more folk festivals than any other province in China. So head on down to southwest China's hidden gem and the gateway to Guizhou. The International Dragon Boat Festival is a wonderful event that can draw a few parallels with the famous varsity boat race between Oxford and Cambridge or even Henley Regatta. It's full of team spirit, with each rower needing to be at the top of his game for the good of the team. In Tongren, it did feel like it was really about taking part, rather than the winning. But if anything, as a tourist, it's also just a good laugh to go down there and enjoy the atmosphere. The festival has led me to an unknown, hidden place in the shape of Tongren. But we've still got so much more to discover, including the area's most scenic and most famous attraction, Fanjing Mountain, as well as get a taste of the local food and see what a real ethnic minority village looks like. So get it in your diaries now. So I managed to find a quiet little spot with which to wrap up the show. I hope you've enjoyed discovering Tong Run with its dragons, dragon boats and dragon boat festival, amongst other things. It really is Guizhou's hidden little secret. 
I'm Mark Edwards, and I'll catch you very soon on another episode of Travel Log. Mm-hmm.